Dr. Brandt. Hello. You know, Again. a couple of weeks ago, Gloria, we were talking about stress and what it does or doesn't do in terms of sexuality, energy, and so on. And our discussions, as usual, go all over the place. But for a couple of minutes, for the sake of probably those who are going to get a chance to view this, I want to talk to you about stress. So for now, for this little episode that we're doing, what is stress? Stress, in my view, which is personal, okay, not gospel, but based on my own understanding and interpretation of the various science that follows it, I would say stress is really when your brain has a fear response or a depression response to a situation and your brain sends out stress chemicals. Hmm. So stress can come from like actually being in a bad situation or in a situation that makes you fearful or makes you hyperventilate or start tapping your foot or, you know, a jittery. And for a lot of people, just feeling that kind of all over body excitement or discomfort, they fear that feeling because they fear it because they know it's going to take them to a bad place, to a dark place. And I'll get back to this because, you know, as a therapist, I would say working on stress is sometimes 80% of the work with a client. Yeah. You know, and so what you experience during stress can be anything from a feeling of, I just can't handle this. This is too big for me. I'll never get through this or I'm going to have a heart attack, or I'm going to do something crazy. Like I'm going to lose control and suddenly start screaming or, you know, acting inappropriately. Or it's the stress of a depressive experience, like someone in my family is sick, someone in my family is going to die, someone in my family is poor, or I can't pay the bills, but it always, I think, comes back to a feeling that the world's problems are so big, or the problems in your life are so big that you won't be able to handle it. And that that triggers a lot of fear chemicals, because remember, we're animals. And we all know how animals react. You know, like the dog, right? A little noise, boof, boof. A loud noise, ow, ow, ow. Yeah, true. Right, and all of that. And we're always laughing at them, you know, like, why are they barking? But, you know, we do the same thing 20 times a day ourselves. We just don't bark. We tense up. Our shoulders get tense. True. Our eyes start to hurt. Our head starts to bound. The top of our head really hurts, right? Uh, all of a sudden, a part of our body, you know, spazzes out. You know, our breathing becomes ragged. All of that stuff. And once it triggers what are also fear kind of behaviors, fear instincts, we either retreat, which means we shut down and get depressed as a result of stress. We can't get out of bed. Understood. We try to think about what it is we should do. And all we can think of are the hundred things we haven't done. True. And we're overwhelmed by that. You know, or the who we're gonna call. And then we become overwhelmed about with 
anxiety about what having a conversation with them will mean. So like if we have rough relationships with our biologicals. And sometimes it isn't even about what's real and happening now. Sometimes it's triggered by, you know, by memories, either memories we actually remember or buried memories. And I'm not talking about that whole codependency thing of, you know, buried right. trauma, you know, but I mean, really, when I work with somebody and I notice their triggers, <clears throat> I know those triggers came from an earlier place. If they can't explain it, like it's one thing, let's say I talked to a woman and she's in shambles because of her stress, but it turns out that she knows where it came from. She was assaulted okay. when she was 14 or 20 or whatever. And she was really okay until then. And that's where it starts. So that's one kind of person that I'll see. But what is much more common <clears throat> is actually to talk to somebody and they really have no memory or they've told themselves a very different story in their head. Like, yeah, my dad touched me, but he was my dad. Maybe he had that right. Or I've never told anybody and I haven't wanted to think about that in 30 years, but I still can't feel comfortable in bed. Like I'm clamped up, like, you know, like a woman. So like a lot of cases of vaginismus, which is not uncommon where the vagina tightens before sex right it can, could be a medical issue so you do have to get checked out by a doctor but more often than not it's a negative memory about penetration oh and you develop a kind of muscle memory i don't want to trigger or upset anybody because somebody out there might hear this and that might be them because it does happen a lot unfortunately as much as uh, you know and it can be anything from something that lasted two seconds but confused them and frightened them sufficiently or upset them sufficiently to an actual uh inappropriate relationship let's say you know incest or something abuse of some kind so and other things childhood illnesses childhood separations adopted kids have a lot of issues even when they were adopted as infants that's you know so anything being bullied at school true okay. because you were too fat or too thin or you were sick and missed a lot of school and you end up being the bullied one or you were a boy and you were raised to be too courteous so people think you're a sissy you know all of that stuff leaves a great chain of buried anxiety Hmm. So an anxiety is also or can be fear related. Absolutely. I think it's really on some level all fear related. You know, I don't know if they could ever scientifically track it, but I think, you know, animals die from stress. True. Very true. We don't. If we have an underlying condition, stress may kill us. But generally speaking, people survive traumas in ways that a lot of animals cannot. And I think a lot has to do with our sophisticated brains that have so many corridors and passages and synapses and nerve you know, nerve endings and, or sorry, neurons. I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. And parts of the brain that learn to compartmentalize. 
but so for example, it's very hard to imagine growing up as a person of color in a culture like America and not having lifelong stress for one reason or another. Even if you think you were part of, you know, even if you grew up in a privileged middle-class environment, didn't matter. There's just no safety in America at any time for people of color, right? So I think that's why we see a lot of, a very high percent of stress-related disorders. I was, see, this is where I was, I was going to go with this because your statement of animals die from stress, people compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. uh, but what that IMHO, in my humble opinion, what that's- Let's say it's so. In my humble opinion. Oh, I am HO. I'm sorry. Um, I thought you were telling me you were HO. And I'm like, is this, that's not there, HIV, right? <laughs> there are times when what the stress produces, the disorders the stress produces, the, the problems that can become manifest and germinate from a single, well, not even a single incident because there are times when it's cultural. Right. Uh, can, can be more unhealthy than just dying from stress. Yes. And that, and it's that compensation that also leads to higher rates of suicide among young gay people and trans people and not always the best lifestyle choices. I don't mean kink lifestyle, but I mean, you know, consumption of drugs and alcohol to yep. medicate life and the pain of life. And we're not, you know, the compartmentalization, you know, arguably is both a survival tool in everything we do in terms mm -hmm. of compartmentalizing so that we're not overwhelmed by any one task. But in, in the terms of compartmentalizing those original stressful situations, are there, well, of course, when you're in the situation, you're not thinking about what to do to rationally minimize it or to be able to think your way through it without freaking out. You know something, Vi, when Trump was voted in for the first time in 30 years, all my Holocaust nightmares came back. I understand. I believe me, I understand. I really felt the Nazis would be knocking at my door. And I went through two weeks of a kind of uh, stressed out fear-based irrationality that I hadn't experienced since my early 20s, when I was still really enmeshed in the whole, my parents' Holocaust tragedy, you know, because that was my history and I was really enmeshed in it, you know, and going to a lot of, hanging out with a lot of Holocaust survivor kids. You used the word irrational, was it? I mean, based on how you grew up, based on all of our knowledge of history, was that fear that irrational? Well, it was irrational because why would the Nazis come pound down my door that week or next month? No, you no. know, I mean, but no, that no. was all, that's what I saw ahead as soon as he was elected. I saw thugs gaining more power. I thought I saw the Ku Klux Klan coming back to life. I mean, really. But those you know, things what? have happened. That's why I'm going. When you use yeah. the word irrational, is it really? Or is it, and I don't mean just you. When, no, when I, we talked a lot about leaving the country. When, like a lot of my friends did. Yes. When, when we talk about irrational, you know, someone uses the term, it's an irrational fear. Um, as I'm reading more and more, so many of what we considered 
irrational fears were actually hardwired into our DNA thousands of years ago. Are so many of these irrational or is there a base somewhere we just can't put our finger on? Well, that goes back to the, I mean, I just, I'm just noting it where when Trump got in, suddenly it was the Holocaust all over again for me. Because one of the neat things about uh, the Jews known as the Ashkenazi Jews, do you know what that is? Where? That's the for the audience, Eastern European based Jews. Right. Okay, who migrated there like in the 19th century or 18th century, some of them. So we're a small group and we all have the same DNA because Jews only fucked other Jews. And we were allowed in the old days to marry our first cousins. You still can, I guess. But those were the Jewish, so like everybody has the same DNA. And so they can study us in a very concentrated way. And they studied the survivors' children to see how trauma affected them and how trauma is passed generation to mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. And apparently most of the kids have all of their parents' problems. <laughs> We're very likely to be depressed. There's a high rate of suicide, a high level of uh, substance abuse. Among the children are survivors who never saw war. So this tells us about human nature, obviously. So what were the children of slaves, that generation? What were their torments? In addition to being so isolated by whites and Americans still treated, you know, horribly, but also to have the burden of their parents' experience on their shoulders and have to navigate now a world that largely remained hostile but where there were some burgeoning opportunities. Yeah. I mean, you talk You know, I mean, and of course, indigenous Americans, what the hell I, I can't are they imagine. still going through, right? I, I can't even imagine. And I have way you too know. many friends who are first. Right. And so, yes, but it also applies like uh, Will, my hu husband, um, he grew up in poverty. He grew up eating, you know, government supplies and moving house to house because they couldn't pay the rent. So when the landlord kicked, you know, they get evicted and moved to the next place. And he was a product of his trauma. Yeah. And he was just a white guy. But, you know, and these things, until you unravel them a little, whether it's through your own reading or through your church or through therapy or whatever works for you, but until you will unravel it and are able to come to a better place, chances are that you will continue to feel those feelings. You will continue to be triggered. So, you know, when you were a child, if there was somebody killed one of your relatives for no reason other than their ethnicity, you might see another death. This is how my parents were. Anytime a Jew got killed anywhere, my parents were overwhelmed. I get it. It was the beginning again. I, I get it. Yeah. Um, but as I say, they don't have to be these cultural traumas. They can be as small as going to school and your teacher letting you know that they don't think you'll ever amount to shit. And how many times does that happen to our youth? Because we don't fit an image or the same teacher had your older brother and or they just right. don't like you. And so it's, you know, you can't. I learned this from my parents because my parents 
were the kind of parents who like, if you said, if you came to me and said, I really don't feel well, they'd say, oh, you think you don't feel well. Imagine when you had a, you, you had to, uh, we had a march across the steps in the middle of winter. <laughs> you know or this thing hurts you should see what happens. you know, you know. <laughs> yeah and it did you know and I was five I mean I didn't you know all I wanted was somebody to pick me up and say it'll be okay right and uh so I can be really triggered by some of these things yeah and have a stress but because I can compartmentalize and I'm strong and I know how to do a lot of self-care, I can get to the other side of it now, which is what I really try to teach people to do is you don't overcome an early trauma. You just don't. What you do learn is how to mediate it within yourself and not be so afraid of being afraid. Is that a form of rationalization or a form of understanding? Well, in order to understand it and to understand yourself, you have to understand where it's coming from. Okay. That really helps. Or you have to at least be in a place where you can accept that something that you know something happened, even if you don't remember it, that other people remembered it hmm. happening to you. Hmm. Like, you might not know you were adopted, but if your parents told you it could raise a lot of questions for you, or how come, you know, how come my grandma raised me and not my mom? Okay. Right? Didn't she want me? That's the first, you know, that kind of thing. So. And you may not, you may think, oh, but I had a great, you know, by the time you're 40, but I had the greatest grandma and fuck ma, you know, whatever. She was no good. And, you know, my grandma raised me. But it actually never really goes away. You may still express that anxiety by, for example, having, you know, an attachment problem if you meet somebody. Like, okay, understood. Understood. If they break up with you, it's like the end of your world. Because it's another person affirming that your mother was right to leave you. Ouch. Right? We are very complicated Ooh. creatures. And you have, to learn, you have to learn that what somebody's true history is, what their real story is. If they're dealing with a lot of anxiety, you try to work on, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw and it was your brain wiring and you have shitty serotonin or, you know, you have a other mental health concern, you know, with a diagnosis. I'm not so cool on the overlabeling of people, but, you know, you know, Everybody has anxiety. So I think it's really, and everybody has trauma. The difference is that some people have the kind of trauma like, uh, I went to school and peed my pants and now I can never, you know, face anyone ever again kind yeah. of trauma. And then other people have the, Jesus is sending you to hell because you said this bad word. And now we have the right to beat you. Right? I was so say you, something about that, but I'll leave that part alone. And then there's the Holocaust. <laughs> but the reality is that all people, you can't compare the extremity of the event what's important is how it affected the person because we are all wired differently so like some of us you know after 32 years of being with will i didn't think i'd be okay four months later and i'm really okay but 
I've known people who were never okay again after the loss of their spouse. They, li they continue to live in the beautiful past. Which is a nice place to visit, but... You Not a good place to live. Mm -hmm. You know, so, like you me, I'm made of tough stuff. But that's why it's really important to know the person because you can't expect everybody to be tough. Lots of people, it's normal not to be tough on the inside. That's a norm. So for me, I don't discourage anybody from going on an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, but I feel it's a matter of personal choice. Okay. Um, but I do help them to not be afraid of the past. And that it, you've just touched on two things I want to touch on or discuss in more in detail the next time we talk, which come down to how to overcome stress. You had talked about uh, therapy. You had also talked about antidepressants, which deal with the chemical side right. of what the brain is doing. And that I would like to make its own topic mm -hmm. uh, because it is such a, an interesting perspective from a therapist. But I'm not a psychologist, much less a psychiatrist. I, understand. I am on that end, the patient. I and so I have seen how they deal with this stuff and how the, some of them have tortured patients of mine with but this you stuff. you are, and you're sitting in a very interesting position from my perspective to talk about stress because of how you counsel, who you counsel, and how stress may affect the people you are counseling. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting perspective because it is not the, we can fix this with a bill. Uh, it is also not the, turn inward. You're seeing this from a position that a lot of people don't. You yeah, and you know, or people say, I'm going to turn it over to God. And I'm always thinking, God doesn't need your anxiety, you know? <laughs> God does not want your anxiety. That's your, you have to own that. <laughs> you have to own it and find a place of peace. I've done very good work on that with people, but it always involves dealing with some painful truths for them. Don't so the question is that. whether, right. So the question is always, are they strong enough to deal with their own truth? Hold that thought, put a pin in that one. We'll be discussing <laughs> that okay. when we come back together. In the meantime, for all of those who will one day watch this, Vi and Gloria sitting around talking, but more importantly, Vi gets to talk to Dr. Bram about topics that I am fascinated with. And being a stressed out individual, stress is one of them. So Dr. Bram, until we meet again, I'm going to teach you a couple of ways to help you cope with that. I can do like a little, you know, session-ish kind of thing. Cool. Although I don't, you know, I, 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 I don't see friends, but I'll make an exception. Because <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing you. No, I will. I'll, I'll bring some uh, of my brain tools with me to help you uh, navigate stress. And I think those who uh, will be watching these episodes are probably going to enjoy watching Gloria get in the Vi's head. This should be interesting. <laughs> For now, Doc, 